All right, so it is 10.01, so I'm going to invite or welcome everyone to our third annual erosion control training. My name is Claudia Guy. I'm the environmental engineer for the city of Fitchburg. I just wanted to go over a quick outline of our presentation today. We have uh, Dr. Anita Thompson joining us to give us uh, some background information on erosion and why it matters. Then we're going to go over the Fitchburg permitting process. Uh, finally, we're going to discuss erosion control practices, and we'll finish off with how to conduct erosion control inspections. A couple housekeeping items. Please type your questions into chat um, uh, and keep yourself muted and your uh, video off during the presentation. Uh, if we're, we do have quite a few people joining today, so please only use the chat to ask questions just so we don't have um, too many things to sift through there. Elliot and Casey are on this uh, on this training and they will be answering questions as we go. So look for answers in the chat to your questions. We will be doing polls throughout the presentation. So please be sure to participate and we will be recording this training and making it available afterwards. You can receive up to one uh, PDH for attending this training if that applies to you. So we're gonna start off with a poll question just to uh, practice. Uh, what is your primary role in the erosion and sediment control process? And uh, Scott, if you can go ahead and put that up, we're gonna leave that on for 15 seconds and let folks uh, participate here. Okay, so it looks like we have 28% of folks are consultants, um, some contractors here, municipal staff as well. Um, and then with, we have some other folks on the line as well. Okay, so that's great. I was, uh, I was not sure how many contractors would be able to participate on such a nice day. So, so glad to see that you're here. Welcome everyone. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Indita Thompson. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and allow her to share hers. And I do want to just quickly introduce her. Um, so Anita Thompson is a professor of biological systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and chairs the water resources management graduate program in the Nelson Institute at UW-Madison. Her research focuses on water quantity and quality impacts associated with land use activities, including thermal pollution, performance of engineered infiltration practices, treatment wetlands, erosion control practices and agricultural management practices, source identification and transport of sediment, nutrient and pathogens through wetlands and wintertime hydrologic pro erosion processes. Um, welcome uh, Anita and thank you for uh, for sharing some information today. Yeah, thanks Claudia and hello everyone. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, Claudia asked if I would give some information on why we care about erosion, why does it matter? And so I'm gonna talk about this um, mainly from an ecological perspective and just highlight some of the reasons why erosion control is important. So just start off with the definition. Erosion is just the movement of sediment by water or wind. Um, it's a natural geologic process that shapes our landscapes over time. So it's you know not inherently a bad thing. Um, it becomes problematic when we've got accelerated erosions that are a result of human activities. Um, so things like agricultural production, construction activities, clear cutting, all of those have the potential to expose bare soil and leave it susceptible to the erosive forces of water or wind. And a lot of this activity um, happens in the upland portions of a watershed, but those uplands are connected to receiving water bodies via the stream network. So for example, um, depending on the flow pathways within a watershed, construction activity um, in, an, in an upland area of a watershed uh, sediment that's eroded from a, a construction site could be deposited in a pond or a waterway. Um, it could enter the stream system and be delivered to a downstream river, a downstream lake, um, a downstream ocean. So everything's connected. So we kind of need to think about um, how the activities that we do within the landscape affect things that are further downstream. 
A number of years ago, the USGS did um, a nice study where they monitored soil loss from two different sites throughout the construction process. So one was a commercial site, one was a residential site. And not really surprisingly, what they found was um, that the highest solids concentrations leaving both of those sites occurred during the active construction phase. Um, and so they were monitoring the uh, sediment of the solids losses in runoff from both of those two sites. At the watershed scale, um, sediment loads tend to increase as the land within the watershed transitions from forested area to agricultural activity um, to urban to urban land use. And there's typically a very high, high peak or spike in sediment yields during the construction phase or during the construction process. So again, the activities that go on within the watershed have downstream implications. There are a number of pollutants in urban runoff. So sediment in and of itself is a pollutant. It takes up storage volume. Um, there's a number of other issues that it creates that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it also carries with it a number of um, other things, other pollutants. So nutrients, pesticides, um, road salts are very prominent in urban environment, um, heavy metals from things like roof shingles or motor vehicles. So there's a number of things that can both attach to soil particles that are moving in water and also be carried in runoff in the dissolved phase. Um, and along with that, urbanization has other um, hydrologic impacts that affect what gets carried downstream. So in addition to the pollutants in urban runoff, there can be significant increases in both volumes of runoff, peak flow rates of runoff, and the flashiness of urban stream systems. So the impervious surfaces that accompany urbanization kind of seal the surface, they reduce infiltration, and in doing so, increase runoff. Um, runoff events happen more frequently and with greater peak flow rates. And so these increases in runoff rates and volumes can also have implications downstream. Um, they can increase the erosive forces in stream systems and destabilize banks and um, promote additional transport of, of sediment downstream. And there's a number of ways that excessive sediment can alter ecosystems or disrupt ecosystems. I've listed just a few of them here. So they range from degraded fish habitat and fish kills, um, excessive weed growth, diminished recreational uses, degradation of drinking water supplies, and then also just changes in the natural hydrology of wetland streams, rivers, and lakes. Um, so I'm gonna highlight just the, the kind of chain of events that occurs with some of these in um, stream systems, wetlands, and lakes as well. So a couple examples for stream systems. If you have excess uh, suspended sediment moving through the stream, this increases turbidity within the stream, which reduces water clarity. And a couple things that this can lead to, it reduces the amount of light that can penetrate through the water and that can lead to reduced plant and algae growth, um, which are both food sources for aquatic organisms. It can also make it just visually more difficult for organisms to find food and detect predators. Excess sediment that gets deposited in streams can do a couple different things. It can fill up the pools and spaces between um, stones. It can bury stony substrates and shelters. And these are areas that typically provide habitat and shelter for invertebrate and fish. And so deposited sediments can affect those kind of habitat conditions. Um, if you get significant sediment deposition in streams over time, it can also change the flow and the depth of river and streams. Um, so it can significantly alter the, the, the flow conditions and what is able to move and survive and thrive within these systems. 
Then for wetlands, um, I mentioned that in urban runoff, so sediment is a pollutant in and of itself, but um, often these waters also carry um, a lot of nutrients with them. So if you've got excess nutrients and runoff, um, one of the things that that can promote is, for example, in wetlands is invasive cattails. If you've got invasive cattails, they can outcompete native plants. And the end result is that you've got a loss of biodiversity, um, which is really important for supporting different animal species and also for promoting water quality as water discharges through wetland systems. If you've got excessive sedimentation in wetland systems, this can do a couple things. Um, as it deposits in shallow areas of wetlands, it reduces the storage capacity. It also changes the amount of time that water spends in the wetland. And so this reduces pollutant removal. It can also bury um, seed banks that are important for establishing native species and promoting biodiversity in the wetlands. And then finally, lakes and oceans. Um, excess nutrients that enter lakes and oceans can promote growth of algae. As those algae um, die and decompose, they use oxygen and that reduces oxygen in the water and promotes dead zones. So these are areas that um, um, other aquatic organisms can't live in because of the reduced oxygen conditions. So most um, folks are probably familiar with the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, um, but these are becoming more and more prominent in the Great Lakes systems as well and other smaller um, surface water bodies. So the picture that I'm showing there in the lower right um, is the, the dead zone in uh, Green Bay, which feeds into Great Lake Michigan. And then in addition to um, the, the growth of algae, some of these algae can be toxic. Um, they can release toxins into the water and those toxins can be harmful for humans and animals. Um, one, of more, one of the more recent high profile examples was in Lake Erie, um, where there was significant algal blooms and um, toxic release from those algae that resulted in water contamination for the water supply that's used for this city of Toledo. Um, so probably one of the more recent kind of high profile examples. So those are just some of the more, it's kind of the ecological issues associated with both excess sediment in suspension in water and excess deposition um, through some of these ecosystems. I wanna just quickly go over the erosion process and then I'll turn it back over to Claudia. Erosion is caused by two primary mechanisms um, when we're talking about water erosion. The first is raindrop impact and splash. So as raindrops hit the ground surface, um, they carry a force with them and that force can disrupt soil particles. Those particles can then be dislodged and they can move in the splash water. So raindrop impact and splash can be responsible for both detachment and transport of sediment particles. If you've got concentrated flow or accumulated flow, um, as that water moves across the soil surface, it imposes a shear force on the soil surface, and that shear force can dislodge and also transport um, soil particles. So in general, the deeper and the faster the water is flowing, the greater the shear force that's exerted on the soil particles and the greater potential there is for um, transport of those particles. And the erosion process consists of three different components. So it consists of detachment, transport, and deposition. And detachment is the dislodging of soil particles. And it's a result again of both raindrop impact and the shear forces of flowing water. Transport then is the movement of those particles, and that can also be a result of the splash of the raindrops as well as the shear force of flowing water. And then deposition is the removal of sediment from flow, and that happens um, typically anytime when the velocity of the water slows down. So anytime that, not anytime, but when the water um, encounters vegetation and slows down, those tend to be times when sediment drops out of suspension or if you transition from a steep slope to a shallow slope, 
Those can be times for the velocity of the flow to slow down and sediment can settle out of suspension. And one of the things um, that I just want to highlight that can happen with raindrop impact anytime you've got uh, bare soil conditions is a process called surface sealing. And so as those raindrops hit the surface, they do a couple of different things. Just the impact can compact the surface of the soil so you can get a thin layer of compacted soil. Um, they also, as I mentioned, dislodge soil particles. And if fine particles get dislodged and move, they can start to fill in some of the pore space on the soil surface. So the combination of those two things can result in a very thin compacted layer across the soil surface, which reduces infiltration and promotes runoff greater the amount of runoff, the more erosion that can occur. So one of the things that can be very helpful is providing some form of cover or some form of established vegetation. And that really just protects the soil surface um, from raindrop impact, and it gives more time for the water to slow down, more opportunity for the water to infiltrate into the soil. And vegetation also can, through its, its root development, can promote channels into the soil and help to keep water moving into the soil as opposed to moving off the surface. So along a hill slope or in a watershed erosion um, transitions from sheet erosion to real erosion to gully erosion. Um, and sheet erosion tends to be in the upland portions or at the top of the hill slope. And it's a result of raindrop impact or and or a thin film of water that accumulates and flows over the surface. So kind of a shearing, very thin film that flows over the surface. As water flows down slope or downstream, um, it concentrates and it forms small channels or rills. And the primary mechanism for erosion in, in rills is the shear force of water as it accumulates and flows through the channel. And then as you continue to move down slope, greater drainage areas, larger flow conditions promote gully erosion. And there the primary mechanism is also the shear force of flowing water. So just a couple of visual examples of what these look like. Um, some examples of sheet and real erosion. So again, a broad thin film of water flowing across the surface or raindrop impact promotes sheet and real erosion. Um, so you can see a couple on the top, water moving in action, and then kind of the remnants of sheet and real erosion in the bottom three figures. The one on the left is an agricultural field, the one in the middle and the one on the right are um, side slopes along uh, retention ponds in an in a area that's developing. Gully erosion, just a few examples um, of that. So these happen um, in the topographic convergences and landscapes, and they'll tend to keep on eroding unless they're stabilized and just continue to get bigger and bigger. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but the picture on the lower left, the really big gully, um, there's a man, you can kind of see a white dot in the background just to give you an idea of scale. Um, that's an adult man that's standing at the top of that gully. So really large soil disturbance there. And then finally, stream bank erosion um, results in the additional loss of soil, um, but it also destabilizes vegetation. Um, and these conditions are made worse through the urbanization process where we've got higher volumes of flow moving through stream systems at higher rates of flow. Um, so for these reasons, to the extent possible, it's important to keep soil in its place um, and to, to keep it from eroding in the first place and transporting downstream. Um, so Claudia, I think I can turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, so I guess before, before you leave, Anita, if anyone has questions uh, for Anita, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I did have one question for you. So in the urban in, environment, um, what, I, I guess, do you have an idea of what percentage of pollution comes from construction sites versus, you know, other areas of the urban landscape? Um, I probably can't give numbers. Um, I, 
I don't know if I can point out someone in the audience, but I did see that Jeremy Belusic was was listening and he always gives a guest lecture in my class and he does a really good job. He's got this really nice pie chart that shows that. So I don't know if he wants to maybe chime in in the chat, but I don't, I don't have exact numbers for that. All right, no, no problem. I was just yeah. curious on that. Um, all right, and I don't see any questions coming in here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I really appreciate you joining today. Thank you. All right, so moving along, we're going to go uh, now to poll question number two. Um, are you interested in receiving a PDH certificate for attending this training? Yes or no? Um, so Scott, if you can go ahead and put that on the screen. Thank you. And uh, it, it looks like um, folks may have put a different name um, when you logged in for Zoom. So if you did that, please email me. Um, uh, Jeff, we can, we can definitely get you a PDH if that's something you're interested in. Uh, just send me an email as a reminder on you know, who you are and then what, what name you signed up as uh, when, you, when you signed in through Zoom. All right, and we also have a response from Jeremy. Construction sites contribute about 25% of the sediment that reaches Lake Mendota. So that is a, that's a pretty big percent there. Um, when you consider that, you know, there's not a whole lot of construction going on. All right, uh, so 70% uh, of folks are interested in receiving that. So we will be sending that out. Um, probably within the week to week and a half after this training. All right, we're going to move on to poll question number three. What is your biggest motivation to do a good job with erosion control? And we've got a couple, uh, question, uh, couple responses there. All right, Scott, if you could go ahead and share the results. All right, great. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of folks uh, caring about the environment, that's really great to see. Um, you know, these are, these are other really good options here. Uh, goodwill from the community, professional pride, and it's the law is of course another uh, good motivator. All right. So just spending a little bit of time here going over the permitting process in the city of Fitchburg. Uh, there are a couple of steps that uh, you would need to go through to get your permit. Of course, step one is submitting your application materials to the city. So uh, that includes the signed application form, supporting materials, the permit fee, and uh, the draft maintenance agreement is one of those supporting materials. Uh, we, we require a complete application to be received before we start the review process. So, so that includes the permit fee. During COVID, we have started the process before getting the permit fee just because City Hall has been closed. And a lot of times people would drop that off in person um, in order to get this review started right away. Um, so, so we have during this time um, started the review without that one piece of the application. Um, but once City Hall opens up again, we're going to go back to requiring everything before we start review. So Dane County reviews the application materials on, the, on behalf of the city for an intergovernmental agreement. Uh, the maintenance agreement may be approved and recorded during this phase. And the turnaround time is typically 10 to 15 days to receive any comments. And then of course, if there are comments, there might be some, some back and forth there. Step three, uh, the city will do a final review and then issue the permit. Uh, we are making a change this year. We're, we're requiring that we receive a recorded copy of the maintenance agreement before um, issuing the permit. Um, that's, that's just based on the experience that we've had. Um, it's always been a requirement um, that folks give us the recorded copy of the maintenance agreement within 30 days after issuing the permit. But we found that 
about 0% of people did that without being reminded and then it turned into this whole thing. So, so now we're just requiring that before we, we issue the, the permit. So just be aware of that change and uh, we'll, we'll send you an email issuing the permit and ask you to fill out an erosion control inspector form. All right. Uh, this is what the inspector form looks like. There are two main reasons that we do this. One, one is to just set our expectations for what the inspector is expected to do. So you, you are expected to look at all of the erosion control measures, um, such as walking the entire length of the silt fence, looking at each inlet protection, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just because we felt that inspectors may not have understood our expectations in the past and uh, might have been doing drive-by or you know, spot checking rather than really looking at everything. And since the inspector may be the only person looking at all of the erosion control, it really is important that they're looking at everything on that weekly basis. And then the second uh, reason why we do that is to collect the uh, inspector's contact information so that we can set them up in Permatrack which is the website where uh, inspectors will input their inspection, um, inspection findings. So during construction, inspections are required weekly and then after every half inch rainfall event, record your inspections in Permatrack, in Permatrack and report any deficiencies to contractors for follow-up with, within 24 hours. Um, so, so just a reminder that if, for example, a lot of times um, a an engineering uh, person might go out uh, and do the inspection and they might not be the person, um, they might not be with the contractor. So, so you are expected to tell the contractor if there are any deficiencies, you're not just putting your uh, findings into permit track. So this is what uh, permit track looks like. You would go in, you would click add inspection then there is a section where all of the BMPs are listed. You would say, uh, yes, it's been inspected. The status is completed. And then the condition, there are a few options. If it's correct, then uh, select correct. If it's not applied, if, if the uh, stone tracking pad is missing, for example, then you would uh, select not applied. If it requires routine maintenance, then you would select that instead. Um, ineffective, if you, if you take a look around and you see that um, what was called for on the plan is ineffective, um, then, then you can uh, pick that one and uh, give some uh, feedback on anything additional that might be needed. If you have any questions about Permatrack or need training on that, uh, Dakota Dorn is the contact for the city of Fitchburg and his uh, email is right there. During construction, of course, maintenance of erosion control measures is needed as necessary, a minimum of 24 hours after the issue is observed. Uh, street sweeping is needed a minimum of daily at the end of the day and it during really wet times or if there's a lot of tracking, you might need to do it more than, than just daily. Uh, dewatering inspection is also required a minimum of daily when you're doing dewatering and that's per the DNR tech standard, which we'll go into a little more details later. So permit closeout, just a couple of closure pitfalls listed here. Inspections must continue until permit, the permit is closed out. Maintenance of erosion control measures must continue until the permit is closed out and building occupancy can only be granted after the permits are closed. And for erosion control permits, this is what we're looking for before closing out that permit. 70% vegetative cover and the site is established, making a distinction there between uh, 70% vegetative cover. Uh, the site being established means that really all of the areas are established. You don't have 70% of the site with really good cover and then 30% without. Really, it's supposed to be everywhere has 70% cover. And um, another example of not meeting establishment might be if there's a channel or swale that hasn't been established, um, that needs to be addressed before closing out the permit. So all special conditions need to be met. And then uh, finally, erosion control measures must be removed after uh, the city has approved um, that permit closure 
has uh, been can can occur. Um, so usually this is a two step process. You would email us saying, hey, we're ready to close out the permit. Casey would go out there and do an inspection to verify that uh, that first bullet has been met. And then she'll email you and say, okay, it looks good. The vegetative cover has been met and the site is established. And then she'll let you know that you can go ahead and um, remove the erosion control measures. Um, and then we'll do a follow-up inspection to make sure those measures have been removed. And then at that point, uh, the permit will be closed. For erosion control and stormwater management permits, so these are permits where there are permanent stormwater measures going uh, that are being constructed as well. Uh, we require the same things and then the additional things that we require are bolded here. So a recorded copy of the stormwater maintenance agreement has been received by the city. Uh, at this point, we're, we would have gotten that earlier in the process. So anticipating that that's not um, an issue at this point, uh, we would require an as-built certification um, of the uh, stormwater practices. And then we have to be provided with a contact for long-term maintenance of the stormwater facility. So that would generally be the owner, for example. So after, um, after the permit has been closed out and uh, you know, the, the co contractor has walked away from the site, uh, the stormwater facilities still need to be maintained into perpetuity. This ensures that the practices continue to offer the same level of protection for downstream landowners as when they were originally designed. And, and at the city of Fitchburg, we have a template for what that annual stormwater ma management maintenance report should look like that's available on our website. And there's a screenshot of it there. The way that we collect the annual report is again through Permatrack. So there are two sections of Permatrack. One is ESC for erosion and sediment control. That's the temporary measures. And then the other one is the private stormwater facilities for the, for the long-term um, stormwater controls. So you, you would go in there and then uh, find, find the site. And once you get to the site, uh, basically you would uh, go to these inspection items. Uh, the, the BMP is just upload your annual inspection form. So you would say, yes, you've done it, it's correct. And then up, up in the inspection documents, you would add a PDF of your um, annual inspection report, and then you would change the status from draft to final and then press submit. And then we would uh, have a copy of that. All right, so uh, let's see if there have been any questions so far. So uh, Jack, is the certificate certificate of occupancy issued in a local county or state law? I'm not sure, Jack. I feel like you might be able to answer that question. Uh, Jack is one of our building inspectors. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, if someone knows. So, so Brad says here, Typically that is through the building inspector and I believe they are granted authority through the building codes to issue certificate of occupancy. Any building inspectors on this training, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, so Brad, the way, the way it works in the city of Fitchburg is um, for uh, the, the building inspectors will, will reach out to public works. It's a separate, separate department and verify and will verify that we have what we need from a stormwater perspective and the things that we're looking for are that asphalt certification and a recorded copy of the maintenance agreement so that we kind of work together on that before issuing occupancy. All right. Moving on to erosion and sediment control measures. Uh, what's the difference? So erosion control helps stop erosion from occurring. Uh, so that's the raindrop erosion and sheet erosion that, uh, that Anita was talking about. And then sediment control captures sediment once it has been displaced to keep it on the construction site. So once you have muddy brown water, the sediment control is going to try to either filter that or settle that out.
All right, so erosion control measures, just a couple of common practices listed here. Sod, seed with mulch and erosion mat, land applied additive, mulch or erosion mat, seeding, directional tracking. You can see how effective these are. Um, sod, of course, is very effective. It's essentially equivalent to um, a fully vegetated site at that point um, at 98% and seed with mulch and erosion mat, 91% effective. Um, that's that's pretty significant. And, and that really just shows how much erosion is caused by that, that rainfall impact land applied additives. So, so you can see these are all, you know, greater than 60% effective, which is great with the exception of directional tracking. Um, but directional tracking is basically, well, it, it requires some time to do, um, but you don't have to, to pay anything for it uh, besides staff time. Um, so that's another one to consider. So sediment control measures, um, sediment basins and sediment traps, 80% removal efficiency. So compared to the last, you know, it's up there um, with the erosion control measures. Um, and then everything else is really 40% or lower. So, so, so the main takeaway here is that erosion control measures much more effective than sediment control measures. Sediment control, unless you have a basin or trap, you're really looking at 40% removal efficiency or, or less. All right, which brings us to our next poll question. Um, which practices are more effective, erosion control or sediment control practices? Um, and Scott, if you can show poll question number four. Thank you. All right, and let's go ahead and show those answers. Okay, uh, so 81% of folks got it right. Good job. Erosion control practices are more effective. Um, it's much more effective to stop soil from dislodging than to try to capture it again after it's already um, in, in the water. All right. So most common erosion and sediment control measures. Sorry, I see a question here coming in from Andrew. How does seeding impact erosion before the seeds sprout? Um, so Andrew, the way that, um, let me go back real quick. The way that I calculated this was by using DNRS and USLE spreadsheet. And it was comparing having no practices over a specific period of time to having these practices in place um, over this two month period. So I think it is, getting at some of that uh, reduction of soil erosion is from the seed sprouting. Um, and that should happen in you know a couple of weeks. Uh, there might be some minimal uh, impact when you put down the seed because it will provide at least a small barrier uh, from rain rainfall impact, but but you're right, I think that the primary impact is once those seeds start to sprout. All right, uh, most common erosion and sediment control measures. Uh, we're just going to go through uh, the ones I've listed here and let's get to it. So ground cover, this is uh, one of the most effective things you can, you can do 92 to 98% reduction of soil erosion. So I gave it three check marks there. And uh, this is what we're talking about when we say ground cover, putting some sort of mat or mulch down. Um, I included this slide because I think it's important for folks who are in the field uh, doing the inspections. You know, a lot of times on the erosion control plan, it says uh, WSDOT, class A, urban, type B, and you go out and you might not know what that looks like. So you see that there's erosion matting in place and you, you might not be able to actually identify if the correct uh, matting has been installed. And, and these mattings are you know, graded for different shear stresses. So it is important as the inspector to be able to identify um, if the correct matting has been installed. 
All right, so um, I'm going to ask folks, I know I said earlier just to use the chat for questions, I'm gonna amend that to say, and answer questions that I ask you. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts on, on what went wrong here in this image? All right, we've got, as the Swede would say, <laughs> I'm not gonna read that one. No staples, didn't staple enough. Matting after vegetation has sprouted. Overlapping is incorrect. Um, overlapped wrong. Not towed in at the upstream end. Okay, that's a good point too. Um, so yeah, all of these are correct. Um, so, so in this case, they didn't staple enough. And Andrew, I can see why you think it looks like they matted after the vegetation has had sprouted. And actually, maybe that's possible too. But, but, but you'll see this happen if you don't staple enough. The the mat will actually lift up off the ground um, after the vegetation starts to grow, and you'll see that the the mat is after a while just a layer above the vegetation and no longer in contact with the ground. Um, so that's um, that's poor installation. If you are inspecting, one way that's easy to tell if uh, the correct number of staples have been added, just go ahead and uh, pull up on that. Um, and if it goes really higher than your than your knee length, uh, than your knee height, then, then not enough staples have been um, have been put in there and and, uh, and then you'll see this kind of thing happen. Um, what Greg mentioned up here, I, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but um, toward the top of the screen, you can see that the, the downstream mat is overlapping the upstream uh, mat. And what you want is you want the mat to be um, overlapped upstream over downstream because water can flow more easily um, in that direction. So for example, if you um, think of fish scales, you can run your hand in one direction very smoothly. And then if you try to go in the other direction, you'll get a lot of friction. Um, and so we're really trying to um, overlap these in a way that water will run smoothly over these mats. All right. And this one, uh, I, uh, I don't think it's easy enough to tell what this picture is, so I'm just gonna answer this question. Do you have any concerns with how this TRM and class two type B erosion mat were installed? Um, what you're seeing here is that the TRM, um, which I, I took apart the, uh, the class two type B mat a little bit so you could see, but it's this black netting underneath. Um, and it's hard to tell, but the, uh, the way that this was installed is they, uh, you know, shaped the berm and then they applied the seed and then they put the TRM on top of that and then they put the class two type B erosion mat directly on top of that. And the way that this should be installed is that the uh, TRM should be placed on the berm and then you should fill in the interstitial spaces of that TRM and then you seed and then you put the class two type B erosion mat on top of that. So uh, an easy way to remember that is if your mat is dark, so if it's the color of soil, then, then typically you need to fill in those interstitial spaces with dirt. Um, and if you're unsure, you can always check the manufacturer's recommendations for installation. All right, silt sock. So uh, silt sock, 40% removal efficiency. I have here, what is the main difference between silt fence and silt sock? Um, when are, when's one applicable versus the other? And if you want to put your thoughts in the chat, go ahead and uh, do that. Sock for flow and swale. Any other thoughts? You can 
You can drive over socks. Yep, you do see that. Silk sock can be moved for site access. Um, that's true, it is easier to move. All right, um, all, all good um, thoughts there. Uh, I, I, so Andrew, we'll, we'll get to um, ditch checks later. And there is a product that looks similar to silk sock that you can put in swales. So I think that's what you're talking about. But, but really when we say um, silk sock, we're talking about a different product. Um, and silk sock is um, essentially uh, equivalent to a silk fence. They're both used in the same application. So this is a trick question. Um, there, there are differences, um, but but you would use them in the same application. So um, silt sock is is also used to treat uh, sheet flow, which is the same as silt fence, um, and you would use them in very similar applications. The main difference being that uh, silt silt sock you have to size. You have to make sure that you're calling for the correct size for the application. So we're going to do an example of what that looks like here. Uh, design considerations are found in DNR Technical Standard um, 1071. And also I just wanted to have a shout out that um, there's going to be a new, actually it's, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a green tier or Dane County guidance document, but uh, there will be a new silk sock uh, guidance document coming out as well, which is meant to supplement the DNR tech standard. So, uh, only applicable for sheet and erosion placed along the contour. Um, log products on disturbed ground should be entrenched two inches and the exception is frozen ground. Um, so these are uh, two tables that I wanted to go over how to use them. Here's a design example. You have a 35 foot long uh, area with a 4% slope. What silt sock size should you specify? So you'd start by going into the row associated with a 4% slope. Then you would find um, the spacing that is just, uh, just higher than 35. So you'd go to the spacing of 40, uh, 40 feet there. And then you can see that a, three, a category three um, product is what's called for. And then you would go to table one and class three is uh, similar to a size 10 to 15 um, silk sock. And I guess what I'll point out there is that, that that is the installed height above grade is 10 to 15 inches. So the answer is that you should plan, uh, that you should specify for a minimum of a 12 inch silk sock. Um, don't forget the two inch required entrenchment, um, which is where why I'm adding two inches to that, uh, to that 10 inch. Um, height because table one is showing the installed height above grade. So you have to consider that entrenchment. Um, and this is probably another reason why you don't see um, silt sock, except maybe for smaller areas, terraces or buildings that are very close um, to the sidewalk because uh, very quickly you would need to use a pretty large silt sock. All right, silt sock installation. Um, we talked about the two inch minimum entrenchment and uh, you should be, these are, these are images from the DNR technical standard. Um, as much as possible, uh, situate your silt sock so it is perpendicular to the direction of flow um, and overlap your silt sock a minimum of 24 inches uh, or more if the manufacturer is more restrictive than that. And I'll, I'll mention that the, um, uh, the guidance document that's coming out has uh, some, some additional um, install, installation guidelines if you're not able to get that 90 degree, um, 90 degree to flow. Okay, so silt stock, sock staking. I just wanted to call out that there are, there are two main types of silt sock. There's a lightweight product and typically you have hay or, um, uh, well, yeah, typically hay inside. And it's something that you can uh, just lift up very easily on your own. You will know if you just try to lift it up if it's a lightweight product. 
Um, and those need to be staked per manufacturer's instructions. And a heavyweight product, um, often filled with what looks like uh, wood chips, those products don't need to be staked. Um, if you can't lift it yourself, then it's a heavyweight product. Maintenance, so remove sediment when deposits re reach half the height of the silt sock. If the product becomes undermined, uh, fill in those voids and backfill with soil and compact it uh, to establish, establish continuous contact between the ground and the product. And if the silt sock rolls out of position, uh, reposition that silt sock and secure it with additional stakes. All right, so another question for the group. Uh, what do you see that's wrong here? If you can type that into chat. Brad commented, heavyweight silt sock can still lift with heavy sheet flow if not staked or dug in. Uh, that's an interesting comment. I would be what I would be interested to know in that scenario if uh, if the silt sock was properly uh, sized for for the area going to it. Not embedded, wrong placement, not staked in. There are gaps in the sock placement. All right, all, all good comments, too much erosion upstream. Um, it, it does look like there's you know erosion on the upstream side. Um, all right, so uh, you can see on that uh, it looks like the um, water is just flowing underneath this silt sock. Uh, so it has, it probably wasn't entrenched to begin with. And at this point um, it's undermined. So, so water is effectively not being treated by this device um, because uh, it's not uh, flowing through the silt sock and it's not kind of pooling on the upstream side, which causes sediment to fall out. Um, it is simply flowing underneath. So, so, so that needs to be re-entrenched or the voids need to be filled in and compacted um, either method. Um, and again, one person commented that uh, there are breaks between uh, the silt socks. So, so that needs to be repositioned um, and it's hard for me to tell what product this is. If this is a lightweight product, then then it the stakes really should uh, be positioned differently there. Water is flowing over the top of the stock. And Andrew, it might be difficult to, to see um, in this image, but if you look really closely, especially in like the lower right-hand corner, you can see uh, what looks like light streaming through. So I think I think water is flowing under the silt sock in this in this situation. Um, what is wrong here? Wrong application. All right. Good job, Brad. So correct. Um, Silt sock shouldn't be put into channel um, situations. Um, so this is just the wrong application. And then in addition to that, it's undermined and uh, ineffective. All right, what's wrong here? Any thoughts, anyone? Not placed along contour, looks good. Um, yeah, and, and Andrew, you might have a better eye for grades than I do. Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, along the contour or not, but um, not trenched. That's true. Actually, it doesn't look like it's trenched in. It's difficult for me to tell. I was actually going to say that this was a trick question and this looks pretty good. Um, 24 inch overlap, that's a good point. This might not be quite 24 inches. I did like the idea of putting a stake on either side of these overlaps, which will uh, help secure, secure that in place. Um, so I would say this is, you know, 
after it rains, you'll be able to tell if more stakes are needed or if, if the overlap was ineffective. Um, but I was gonna say this probably looks pretty good. Definitely could have been improved by trenching it in. And, and you're right, Steve, this might not quite be 24 inches here. All right, tracking pads. Let's see how we're doing with time. All right, I'm gonna speed it up. Tracking pads, knock mud off of your tires um, with stone. Um, here's the typical dimensions, 50 foot minimum length and 24 foot minimum width. Um, if you're having a trouble losing stone, if you're in a, uh, for example, um, very wet area, you might consider putting down a check textile underneath your stone, or if you have just a long project and you want your stone to last longer. Um, in this situation, the main thing that's wrong here, of course, is that your tracking pad is completely ineffective at this point. It's been completely uh, logged with uh, soil. If it was ever there, it, it looks like it, there probably was one at this at some point. And the, the problem with this uh, application is that the wrong size of stone was used. So you do need three inch stone. That's three inch stone is more effective at knocking um, mud off of your tires. So this is um, the wrong material being used. Maintenance, uh, refresh the existing stone by uh, roughing it up with rakes. Um, is primarily how that's done. Uh, you can put down more stone when refreshing is no longer effective. Uh, for very muddy sites or sites where you have uh, a long duration for the project, you may want to consider a manufactured construction exit. And this is uh, just one product called FODS. Uh, they have these uh, triangular pyramids that uh, act similar to stone, they knock. Um, knock mud off of your tires as you drive over that 50 foot length. And you would clean this with um, a, a broom, a mechanical broom is typically how that's done. Here's another type of product, a metal tracking pad. Uh, you can see in this case, uh, the way that this one works is that uh, mud gets knocked off of your tires and there's actually space under the tracking pad for the mud to accumulate. So um, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, just wanted to call out that DNR does have uh, a tech standard. It, so these new manufactured track out devices are um, discussed in their tech standards. So you can use them in conjunction with a uh, stone tracking pad if you like. Um, this is one example of what that application might look like where you have the stone tracking pad and then you put the manufactured track out on top of that. Um, so that's, that's an option. Um, you can also um, just use the manufactured track out. Um, you would still need to get that 50 foot length. Um, so uh, I, I think you might find that this, this might be more effective than just putting the manufactured track out directly on the soil underneath. Um, so maybe that's why people choose to do it this way. All right, street sweeping. Uh, when to clean up at the minimum uh, should be done at the end of each workday. Um, and if warranted, it should be completed at a higher frequency. If a lot of tracking is occurring, um, then we would expect to see you out there um, dealing with that more than just at the end of the workday. Um, keep the tracking pad, pad refreshed and clean and it will help to cut down on tracking. How to clean up, a mechanical removal using brooms, shovels, or street sweepers, uh, bring the sediment back to the construction site or dispose of it appropriately elsewhere if you choose to, um, power washing and a back truck. So if you do use water, you need to um, then suck it back up. Do not just wash sediment into the storm sewer. Uh, this is an example of a pretty poor path poor tracking, and you can see that the material has packed pretty significantly onto the asphalt surface in this situation. So moving on to inlet protection, um, again, 30% removal efficiency, that was one of the least effective um, 
protective measures that we saw. Um, so this should really be considered your last line of defense. Um, it catches some sediment before it enters the storm sewer system, so that's great. Um, but, but again, it really should be considered your last line of defense. Um, all right, so the new inlet protection standard, we have um, a framed inlet protection. This is what it looks like once it's installed. Uh, just a note to remember that there is a curb back extension to catch water uh, toward the back of that, uh, of that inlet. So make sure that curb back extended piece is actually extended. Um, and that's something you know you should look out for when you're installing it. And then as an inspector, you should be looking for that as well. And here's what it looks like from the top down with that extended piece back here. All right, okay. And uh, this is a question. You have a tracking pad on the right-hand side and the disturbed area is on the right-hand side. Then uh, the tracking pad uh, abuts a street and there's an inlet. Uh, to the left. The direction of flow is from left to right, so, so water is flowing towards the disturbed area. Just a question on if you would put inlet protection into that inlet. What are your thoughts? Jack said yes, Brent said no. If the road is crowned, yes. All right. So I, I would say yes, um, just because you have a tracking pad here, so you know that this this is being used as a construction exit, which means you will have tracking on the road here. Um, there will be dirt. So uh, even though a lot of times you think of putting inlet protection only, only down in, on downstream areas from the disturbed area, in this case, because you have tracking that, that will very likely reach that inlet, um, I would put inlet protection there. I think that's appropriate. All right, maintenance. Uh, inspect for sediment buildup, remove sediment deposits when sediment has reached one third to one half depth. And you may consider removing that more frequently. From what I've heard, these um, framed inlets can become very heavy and kind of difficult to maneuver if you, if you let it get to that half, um, half full depth. So just something to consider. And then sediment deposits should be placed in a suitable area. Back within the, the construction site is the most um, obvious spot to bring it. And then replace the bag if it's torn because it will no longer be effective at capturing sediment if water can bypass the uh, bag, which acts as a filter. And here's just an example of um, sediment that has built up basically to the, to the full height of that sediment bag. Um, and that would require uh, maintenance. All right, poll question number five. How effective is inlet protection at removing sediment from dirty water? All right, if we can go ahead and share the results. Okay, so correct, 30% um, is how effective inlet protection is. Um, and, and just remember uh, to the about 30% of people who thought it was more effective than that, it, it really isn't. So, so just something to keep in mind that inlet protection is really that last line of defense um, and uh, it should be treated as that the other erosion control measures within your site are still important. Okay, so dewatering. Uh, dewatering occurs uh, when you have 
low-lying areas that you need to remove uh, water from. So for example, if you have basements that are excavated, um, you might have to pump out the water and, uh, and bring it somewhere else. So in this case, and it's difficult to tell if there's a sediment bag over there, but for the sake of argument, let's say there isn't one over there. So this would be um, inappropriate dewatering because there's no dewatering um, dewatering capture device. Uh, dewatering practices, route your pumped water to either a dewatering bag, a sediment trap or basin, an above ground settling area, or other filtering or settling device. Um, you have two, two images of uh, different types of devices down here. The most common would be the dewatering bag. And you can see um, it's really important to make sure that the hose has a tight connection with the dewatering bag because the way it works is water is forced to filter through the dewatering bag before it's released. Um, otherwise, if, there, if there's not a good um, connection, then it, the water that spills out obviously hasn't passed through the device. Um, and then over here, we have a, uh, a basically a, a, a trash container with baffles that have been put in there. Quick reminder that silt fence is not an appropriate dewatering practice. Um, silt fence should only be used for sheet, sheet flow applications. So DNR technical standard, which came out, um, it was either last year or the year before, um, had a couple of uh, main takeaways in my mind. Uh, one is that daily monitoring of dewatering is required. So while dewatering is occurring, you should be conducting at least daily monitoring of the effluent. And they have, we now have a visual transparency standard. And if, uh, if you don't meet this transparency, transparency standard, then you need to um, reevaluate your dewatering practices and modification is needed. So this is what the dewatering standard, uh, the visual standard is. Modification to practices is needed if a secchi disc is not visible at a depth of five inches. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can see what a Secchi disc is. It, it's a high contrast um, device. And um, on the left, you can see if you have very, very clear water, um, then you can really see that Secchi disc very easily um, uh, when it's in the water. And on the right-hand side, it really becomes difficult to tell um, the difference between the white and black areas of that Secchi disc um, if the water is cloudy. So you, what you can use is either a transparency tube with a secchi disc at the bottom, um, or probably an easier way is to just have a clear container. A 16 ounce mason jar works great and put your secchi disc at the bottom, fill it up with that dewatering effluent and uh, see, see if, uh, if that visual standard is met. This is just an example of what um, what that looks like, acceptable discharge versus nuisance conditions. And uh, if you are in that nuisance area, then you do have to consider uh, modifying your dewatering measures. Uh, this is just another example of um, that dewatering bag. Uh, one thing that I, I, I wanted to point out is happening here. I, I really like that the dewatering bag is, is placed outside of the construction area on an area that is vegetated. If you put your bag into the construction area on bare soil, then, then after water has flowed through the bag, then it's more likely to pick up sediment again um, than if you're able to find a, uh, a stabilized area to do that. And again, silt fence is not an appropriate dewatering device. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, it looks like water was sent to this sediment basin to allow um, sediment to uh, settle out. But on the, on the right hand side here, you can see it's being pumped out of that basin and um, uh, sent to this area over here. And it looks like, at least from this image, it looks like the water clarity standard has not been met. Um, so, so really this 
this uh, pumping should not have been occurring um, before um, either giving this area more time to settle out or adding polymers or some sort of additive um, to get that soil to actually settle out before pumping it. Ditch checks. So ditch checks have 30% removal efficiency and they work by slowing the erosive velocity of the water. Um, they cause water to pool behind the ditch check, which um, causes large particles of sediment to settle out. They do prov also provide um, some filtration in low flow situations, but I would say uh, the primary mechanism here is creating that pool where water can, uh, where sediment can settle out. Types of ditch checks, these are the two most common, so stone ditch checks and also hay bales. It's important to note that if you're using hay bales, uh, you need two rows and they should be um, shifted so that the, the breaks are not occurring in the same spot, similar to bricks, if you can imagine that, um, how bricks are laid. And that's because uh, the weak point is where the hay bales come together. So you would want the weak point of one row to be a different weak point from the row behind it so they can uh, be more structurally sound. All right, design criteria can be found in DNR Tech Standard 1062, minimum height of 10 inches, remove ditch checks once the final grading and stabilizing is applied. Additional considerations to think about here. For channel applications, um, please note when you are laying these out that they should be spaced according to um, an equation which is found in the DNR technical standard. And, and the equation is on the, up, uh, the, the upper portion of this uh, screen, but on the lower portion, um, basically what you're doing is you want the, uh, the top of your downstream ditch check to be at the same elevation as the toe of your upstream ditch check. And that's how that uh, spacing and that spacing is achieved by using the uh, equation above. All right, so design criteria um, can be found, oh, again, in this DNR tech standard. Um, this is the, uh, the matrix. Oh, okay, so I did want to mention that the DNR tech standard, um, in terms of what material is uh, appropriate to use, it, it calls out the WIS.PAL. Um, so, so this is the, uh, and I'm, I apologize, I can't see the top of my screen, but I, I think it's called the uh, concentrated flow matrix or, or something like that. Uh, I apologize, I can't read that part of my screen. Um, but, but just note when you go into these matrices on the WIS.PAL, there are two, there's one for sheet flow and one for channel flow. Um, so just make sure you're looking at the channel flow one if you're wanting to size um, ditch checks. So we're gonna do an example together. If you have a 1200 foot long channel with a 4% slope, first you would go to the uh, correct uh, column. Uh, this is the two to four percent area. Then you would go to uh, the specific column associated with 1200 feet. Um, and then you can see which, uh, if, if there's a solid black bar, then those are the um, applications that are relevant in this situation. Um, the dashed black bar, uh, they, they also can be used, but they are generally considered to be um, overkill. So they are, they're more expensive than what you need. Um, so, so in this case, you can see temporary ditch checks, hay bales or approved manufactured alternatives listed in the WIS.PAL or stone or rock ditch, ditch checks. Um, the, the last two that are listed are erosion mats, um, and, and that's really for stabilization after construction has, has occurred. These first two are the ones that we, you would use as, as temporary um, stabilization during construction. So, so these first two are the ones that um, I'd recommend. Oh, and it looks like I missed 
one here, double netted light duty erosion mat. So, so again, that's one that you would put um, towards the, the end for stabilization. Um, I wanted to spend a minute just going over what are those approved manufactured alternatives listed in the WIS.pal. Um, so you would go to this website listed at the bottom of the page. Um, and this is, uh, these are the approved um, ditch checks uh, in the, in the WIS.pal. So these are the only ones that you could use um, as ditch checks. Most of these uh, look more significant than just uh, a silk sock. So, so you should be able to tell the difference if you, if you look these up. All right, installation. Um, we kind of talked about the, the first half of this slide, the, the, the top half. Um, the bottom half, uh, the main takeaway here is that you want water to flow over your, um, your stone ditch check. So you want to have a U shape to your ditch check and um, you give yourself a six foot minimum indentation in the middle of your ditch check. And that's where you want storm water to flow over the device. So maintenance considerations, remove sediment deposits when deposits reach half the height of the ditch check. Um, in this case, you can see that sediment has actually reached the top of the ditch check. Um, so, so that sediment needs to be uh, removed, it should have been removed a while ago. Um, removal of sediment may require a replacement of stone. Repa replace hay, ba hay bales as needed when they rot. Um, and the typical life expectancy for hay bales is about six months. So if you have a longer project that's going to be going on for more than six months, um, you might at that point consider uh, stone ditch checks instead of hay bales. All right, what is wrong here? If you can put your thoughts in the uh, chat. All right, um, Andrew says no indentation. Brent says, oops, uh, no channel overflow. Rock is too big, not covering the entire area, not tall enough. No erosion control used. Center of check is not the lowest point, um, not wide enough. It looks like water is flowing around the sides of the check. So, so yes, that's, that's probably the biggest problem here is that, um, the lowest point of these checks is not the center of the checks. So water will flow around the sides. Um, and I think, here we go. I have, I have an image of what that looks like. If you, if you don't do that indentation, then water will flow around the sides and actually um, cut into the uh, soil on, on the sides instead of safely passing over the ditch check. Um, And, and, and Jean, I agree, it's not covering the entire area. I think if, if we had made these ditch checks wider, um, as you said, Pedro as well, um, then, then we could have achieved this U-shape. Um, the, the, oops, the U-shape um, for, for these ditch checks. All right, poll question number six. When do, when do ditch checks need to be maintained due to uh, sediment accumulation? All right, Scott, if we can go ahead and show the results. 
Okay, great job. Most people got this, half the height of the ditch check. That's when it's due. You can certainly do it sooner. Um, and, and you might have noticed a pattern. Most, uh, most sediment control measures need to be maintained when you reach half of the height of the silt fence or the silt sock or the inlet protection. Okay, sediment basins and sediment traps. Okay, I'm gonna fly through this. 80% uh, effective. Um, so, so these are really the best sedimentation um, devices that we have. Primary differences are that sed sediment traps um, are for smaller areas, smaller watershed, and sediment basins are for watersheds greater than five acres. The sediment traps have um, a stone outlet structure that serve as both the overflow spillway and deep watering, whereas sediment basins have a principal outlet structure and overflow spillway more similar to what you would see in a permanent pond. How they work is that they settle water as water flows through the device. Um, so, the, so the most important design consideration is the size of these uh, of these devices. Um, the DNR tech standard has sizing criteria, so please be sure to go through that method uh, when you determine the size of the basin that's needed. And the plans should call out the size of the basin and it should be shown to scale on the plans. Sediment traps. Um, you can see here, uh, the hatched area is the uh, stone outlet device and uh, it's typically one and a half feet tall. And water goes over the emergency spillway and then the rest filters through um, that, that stone device. You can see that the bottom of the sediment trap is actually three feet below the bottom of your stone. So that's what that typically looks like. Sediment basin looks much more similar to a, um, a permanent, stormwater pond with your um, constructed uh, uh, control structure here. I guess I'll also note that you have um, a five foot depth. So three feet uh, is the dead storage depth and then two feet for the sediment um, storage. And you would want to empty that out once you, once you reach three feet, once, once that two foot at the bottom has been filled with sediment, that's when you would want to remove the sediment in this application. So temporary seating, 60% removal efficiency. Um, we're at, uh, yeah, I'll go through this. We have five minutes here. Um, when is temporary seating needed? Stockpiles that won't be worked for more than seven days and areas that won't be worked for more than 14 days. Um, what's wrong here is it looks like, um, you know, obviously if the winter is coming along, then you won't be working these stockpiles for more than seven days. And it looks like they were not seeded before the winter came. So that should have been done um, prior to winterization. And I, I wanted to end where I began with ground cover because it is one of the most effective things that you can do, 79 to 98% removal efficiency um, and really just, uh, putting anything down to uh, slow and um, provide a barrier from that raindrop impact will, uh, will really do a lot to help keep the, the water running off of your site clean. So how to conduct erosion control inspections. Uh, poll question number seven is, are you responsible for conducting erosion control inspections as part of your job? And Scott, if we can go ahead and show the answer. All right, so 70% of the folks here are responsible uh, for doing erosion control inspections. I hope you found um, the previous section helpful and then this section as well. Um, so the erosion control inspector form does have list some of our expectations here, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a, uh, a longer checklist of what we're looking for, um, checking all of the measures that are shown on the plan, of course. Does the street need to be swept? Um, if dewatering is happening, have you checked the clarity of the water? Are stockpiles temporarily seated? 
et cetera, et cetera. Poll question number eight. Do you prefer having this training in person or online? And Scott, if you can go ahead and show that answer. All right, so a lot of folks prefer this being online. Um, that's that's helpful to know for me. Um, you know, in the past we had this in person um, and maybe we'll make this a permanent change to have this online. All right, so with that, we have uh, three minutes to spare. Does anyone have any closing thoughts or questions that weren't answered? Uh, although manually you hand it out in the past is very helpful. Okay, um, that's good to know. Yeah, we I took out the manual this year. I wasn't sure um, how many people will use it. Uh, when we have it in person, we can actually talk about what works and what doesn't work. Um, that's true. We, we are missing that in this um, virtual format. Although I do appreciate that folks were, um, you know, participating via the chat. All right, thanks, Jack. Are you going to send the slides you used? Yes, so um, after this presentation, I'm, I'm, you'll get one more um, email from me and it will be, uh, I'll ask for feedback. So I would really appreciate it if you would fill that out and give me feedback on things you would like to see for next year or if we spent too much time on something that you felt was not helpful. Um, and then the other thing I'll do is I'll send out the slides. And, and we did record this, so um, we'll also make the recording available. Uh, for Fitchburg, is it possible to have a maintenance agreement approved from Fitchburg while concurrently having the county review it? So, so Bill, that is the plan. Um, the county is going to let them know um, once once that can be recorded so, so they can record it um, during that step two process. We have at this point a template that has already been vetted by the city. So if they're using that template, then it should, should be good to go. And then um, unless there's something not in the template, I wouldn't feel the need to look at it again. How is the annual inspection requirement enforced? Um, so, so this is not a requirement. This is just a recommendation. So we do recommend that folks attend the annual inspection um, training and it's available once a year. And uh, I, I think my recommendation was to attend every other year, but it is a recommendation, not a requirement. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. And uh, see you next year or around down.